Well, good morning, church. It is great, great to be with you today. What an honor to be with this church family. I bring you greetings from the Park Plaza Church in Tulsa. There are so many connections, so many shared stories. Uh, our church greatly loves and appreciates this body of believers, inspired so many ways by the great works that God is doing through you. And it is a great honor for me not only to be in your presence today, but to be filling this pulpit of all of the preachers that I am inspired by today, by their words and their deeds. Phil Brookman is a blessing to my life. It's not only an honor, it's a little bit daunting. Uh, Phil can bring it, and I am encouraged to be a better preacher by knowing Phil Brookman. And I tell you, knowing Scott for all of these years, and many on your staff, it has been one of the greatest blessings to my spiritual walk. As Scott said, we served together, he and Ada, I in Tulsa, and our paths would cross uh, over and over again in our years of youth ministry. I know of Scott, I know of Sonia, what a wonderful family. But I feel a little bit like uh, the words in Revelation to the Ephesian church, of all of the things that I appreciate about this church and Phil and Scott, this one thing I, I hold against you. Uh, I was raised down Dallas and Austin way. And I know that here in the great state of Oklahoma, uh, you know, that Red River rivalry and all of that. And Scott, he, I mean, bleeds crimson and cream. He, he sooner through and through. And I know many of you, a hearty amen to that. And as I go in his office this morning to prepare and look over my notes one last time, I, I realize he has not only passed this love on to his children, but now to his precious baby granddaughter. Go ahead and bring up that picture that's in his office. And, and I, I see this, but what really disturbs me, zoom in on that picture. How is that possible? How is that possible? Now, now, Scott, if that is a gene thing and, and it is just hereditary, I'm okay with that. Brother, if you use tape or glue, <laughs> I need you to respond this morning. Okay. okay. I, I tell you, it is sometimes not difficult, difficult at all to see where people's allegiance lies. There are other things, though, that are tougher to see. I don't know if you've seen the artwork through photography of this Chinese gentleman named Lou Bolin. Lou Bolin has several books. His first, Hiding in Plain Sight. Now his books aren't big on words, but the pictures do all of the speaking. Uh, go ahead and bring up that first picture of Lou. What Lou likes to do is literally paint himself into the backdrop, into the canvas. Do you see in this soda pop aisle of a grocery store, do you see Lou standing there, hiding in plain sight? Go ahead and zoom in. Maybe this will help a little bit. This next picture, there's Lou. He kind of gives, him, gives himself away a little bit. In this next picture of Lou, I think we've got him uh, in a wood pile. It's amazing. You can see the face there. Go ahead and zoom in on this next picture, and there's Lou. In this next shot, I think we've got him in front of construction equipment. On this one, I could not find him at all. Your only hint that I'll give you is look for the shoes. There they are by the tire. Go ahead and zoom in. And it's still tough to see him on that one. And this next one, I think, is the most difficult piece in front of a staircase. But to get the symmetry right, to get the perspective right, if he takes one step forward or one step back, it doesn't work. Go ahead and zoom in. And in our lives, we encounter things that many times are hiding in plain sight. Sometimes in life, in the midst of trials and storms, in the midst of tribulations in our lives, it can be tough to see Jesus. Though some of us, our allegiance, people know where we stand. But sometimes in the midst of job loss, or a diagnosis, or a move, or a financial downturn, or any number of other trials in our lives, it can be tough to see if Jesus' allegiance is still on our side. He's tough to see. His plans, His presence can be difficult to discern. 
in this series, and I appreciate so much Phil laying this out, in turning points and in transformation, we need to understand today that in trials, when we begin to question, uh, is Jesus with me? I'm finding it difficult to see him. We can encounter a transition to not only see him, but to understand that he has never been with us more than in the midst of difficult times. If you have your Bibles this morning, please be turning to the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark chapter 6 and verse 45. So we sang moments ago about life's sea billows rolling. And this morning as we begin to talk about storms and trials that we go through, Let's take a look at how Jesus comes to those that love him and those whom he loves in the midst of a storm. Mark 6 and verse 45. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. While he dismissed the crowd, after leaving them, he went up on a mountainside to pray. Then night falls, then evening comes. When evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was alone on the land. He saw the disciples straining at the oars, because the wind was against them. Not in the first, or the second, or the third, but about the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them, walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by, but when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost, and they cried out, because they all saw him, and they were terrified. Immediately he spoke to them and he said, Take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And then he climbed into the boat with them. The wind died down. They were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves. Their hearts were hardened. When they crossed over, they landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. As soon as they got out of the boat, people recognized Jesus. They ran throughout the whole region and carried the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into villages, towns, and countryside, they placed the sick in the marketplaces. They begged him to let them touch even the edge of his cloak, and they all who touched him, well, they were healed. This morning, we understand this story is off the heels of Jesus feeding the 5,000. He puts them into the boat. And as he puts them into the boat, and evening falls, as they're on the midst of their travel to Bethsaida, only a few miles away, we need to understand that the wind isn't with them. It's not in the neutral position, but the wind is coming dead at them, is strongly against them. The language used in that original language in the Greek, it says it is an excessively strong wind. As night comes down, they battle, they strain at the oars through the first, the second, the third. And now, as dawn is closer than the evening when it came, in the fourth watch of the night, we understand that they have been straining at the oars for hours and hours and hours, perhaps the better part of a third of a day. For eight hours, they strain at the oars. This morning, our first fill-in, our first point is this. You can be in the middle of God's will and still encounter storms. You can be in the smack dab middle of doing what God told you to do and still encounter trials and difficulties in your life. Now you need to understand this, that in following God's will, you will bypass, you will miss out, on numerous, numerous difficulties in this world. When you live your life according to God's plan, you will skip not only you, but those that you guide, your friends, your neighbors by way of example, your families, and following your lead as a disciple, you're going to miss out on a world of hurt. But at the same time, as you follow the Lord, There will be trials. Notice the language says, Jesus made them get into the boat. In the original language, it is Jesus forced them to get into the boat. 
you almost see the scene playing out like this. Jesus inviting them to get into the boat. And as the carpenter tells these fishermen who have made their lives, have lived their lives on the shores of Galilee, to get into the boat, they see the skies, they see what's about to happen, they feel the wind picking up, and they, the sailors, the fishermen, say to the carpenter, we're going to skip out on that invitation. We've seen this scene before. Now is not the time to get into the boat. And Jesus' invitation, a request, now turns into him forcing them almost physically, if not so, into the boat. And as they are telling him, we are the guys who grew up around here. You are the carpenter from up in the hills. You don't know what we know. And nevertheless, into the boat they go. And as they try to go just a few miles from Capernaum to Bethsaida, they can't get there. They spend the better part of the evening, if not the whole evening, stuck in the middle of the lake. And then Jesus, it's almost cruel, is not unaware of what they're going through. He sits up on the mountainsides of Galilee on the hills and looks down and he watches them strain at the oars. You almost expect him to go down there in the first watch of the night and go, guys, my bad. <laughs> you were right. This really is a rough storm. You knew best. I shouldn't have put you here. My mistake. But he doesn't do that. And he doesn't go out at the first or the second or the third watch. He waits. And as the dawn is about to come up, it is then that he goes. Why would Jesus do this? Where someone that doesn't know Jesus would almost, and you understand their estimation, and this being an act of cruelty. You know, speaking of an act of cruelty, every once in a while to get my workout regimen back online, I'll make the mistake of hiring a trainer, okay? And when I hire a physical trainer, my last one for my love of carbs, he began to call me bread boy. He'd say, bread boy, get over here. And on occasion, he would put me on this rowing machine. And he knew what he was doing as I would strain, not for eight hours, for eight minutes. And he would sit there and watch me, and there was some type of demonic enjoyment in this for him. And as I was sitting there, I understood, and he understood as I make light of that, that he was trying to develop within me something that was of a physical strength. When Jesus puts us in situations where we're wondering what's going on, church, you can be sure, whether it's an individual a family, or an entire church, as you strain at the oars and you know that Jesus is watching, as you strain at life in trials and troubles and you know Jesus is watching, it is because in the same way a trainer is trying to develop in me or in you something physical that is strong, Christ is trying to develop in us something of faith that is strong. It's a little over three years ago. The first miracle was is that I went in to see my doctor for a cough. Usually I'll break a bone and stay away from the doctor. I don't prescribe that to you, but that's the way I'm made. For a cough, I finally go in after six months of struggling with this cough I can't get rid of. I roll in, my doctor, a second miracle says, instead of, hey, take this pill, I'll see you in a couple weeks. He says, Mitch, we're going to do an x-ray right now, and tomorrow morning we're going to do it tomorrow morning. be in the lunch hour I'm standing in a line for barbecue with a few friends text comes across my phone from my doctor Mitch I want to see you right now and bring your wife Shannon with you and I've never gotten that from my doctor before and it's not a good feeling come see me now but bring your wife with you I knew it was my heart I just knew it and as I called Shannon said meet me there we got to the doctor uh, Brent I know it's my heart he says your heart's fine but this lemon-sized tumor right next to your heart, uh, that tumor has to come out. And so full-blown sternotomy, have a run-in with cancer. Long story short, I'm in the midst of this trial in my life where I'm beginning to wonder in the midst of this storm as you begin to think about the end of you in this life, Christ begins to develop in me something that was not there before. About a year and a half ago, I go down to visit my daughter at college. She sees me. She says, Dad, what's wrong with your eye? I said, nothing's wrong with my eye. She goes, yeah, something's up. I just blew it off. 
drive back, get to Park Plaza, preach the next morning. I'm walking up into the pulpit. A woman who's known me for 40 years says, Mitch, what's wrong with your eye? At that one, I run into the men's restroom. I look in the mirror, and my left eye is about halfway down. Must be some allergy. Go back to the doc. He said, Mitch, this is related to your cancer, and you're running with that. We thought you were past it, but now we're seeing. And he, he, I never heard this word before. He says, you've got this disease named myasthenia gravis. Well, what in the world is that? Well, that's the Latin for grave muscle illness. Well, how do I whoop this one? Mitch, you're not going to whoop it. You're going to struggle with this one for the rest of your life. You know, and as I struggle with that storm, I begin to wonder what God was doing in my life. How in the world, in the midst of this, could he be doing anything that was building something within me? And let me tell you a blessing of the second trial, myasthenia gravis. Uh, right before my eye goes all the way shut, I develop this mad sense of double vision. And so it's great for a preacher's count for when I see a thousand people and say there's two thousand, I'm being honest, that's what I saw. Now I told my church that when I really begin to squint, this is the other blessing, this is how I see myself in the pulpit. Go ahead and bring up this picture. That's me on, when, I'm, when I'm preaching. When I get that real squinty eye working, man, and it brings them down the aisles at the invitation. Now when I told my church this, my older members fired back, and they said, Mitch, when you get a squinty eye, you look more like this. Go ahead and bring up that picture. And uh, that's not exactly how I picture myself. Now, my younger folks at our church, they don't even know who Popeye is. And they said, Mitch, you look like this. And so anyway, there's an upside to everything. Let me share with you this morning James chapter 1 and verse 2. Consider it pure joy, my brothers. Whenever you face trials of many kinds, I, I got to back up. Consider it what? Oh, I can maybe get to okay. Consider it okay. No. Consider it joy. That's not scripture either, is it? Consider it pure joy. When you face trials of many kinds, well, how in the world can I do that? Because you, you kind of think and hope that maybe God is doing something. That's not scripture. We consider it pure joy whenever we face trials of many kinds because we know, we don't think, we don't hope, we know that the testing of our faith, it develops something within us called perseverance. Perseverance must finish its work so that you'll be mature and complete, not lacking anything. This morning, church, understand, God is not always trying to deliver you from something, but instead trying to develop you into someone, a follower of Christ. This morning, number two, you can be in the midst of God's presence and still encounter fresh understandings of Him. The disciples had heard the best lessons ever preached. The apostles had seen miracles. Mark 6 and verse 7 on through verse 12 says, Mitch, you haven't got the half of it. They haven't just heard the best teaching. They haven't just seen the miracles. But they themselves have been teaching about the kingdom. And they themselves have been casting out demons, anointing the sick, and healing the sick. The twelve have not only been witnessing miracles, they've been bringing by the power of God miracles into being. They've seen all this. They follow. But it is in the storm that they gain a fresh understanding. And those fresh understandings are not always warm fuzzies. It says they thought he was a ghost and they were terrified. Storms in our lives, whether they are job loss, sickness, illness, the death of a loved one, trials of many kinds can lead us into his presence and an understanding of his presence and a fresh understanding of Christ like never before. At the moment that we're about to lose it, and here it is, how in the midst of his presence can I gain a fresh understanding of him and all I want to do, Mitch, 
is due to anxiety, lose every bit of faith I already had. And what you're saying is, is in the midst of the storm, not only do I not have to lose that faith, but I can grow in faith and gain and glean a better understanding of who he is. Mitch, I've been married for 50 years, for 60 years, and the loss of a spouse, you're saying I can actually grow in trials of many kinds. My job didn't head south. My job is gone. The loss of a spouse is one thing, but the loss of a child is another. And you're saying in the midst of the storm that is rattling me and our church family with questions down to our core, we can grow in faith? How do we not lose it? Jesus gives three statements that allow us to begin the process of growing in our understanding of him in the midst of the storm. Statement number one, take courage in the midst of your anxiety and you're about to let everything go and be done Jesus says to them as he's walking out on the lake take courage loose translation today would be get a grip on yourself right here in the present muster something to understand what Christ is about to real reveal to you take courage number two it is I, in the Greek, ego a me. Jesus just dropped the big one. Take courage in your present so you can remember who I've been in your past. How's he getting there? He just said it. I am. It is I, the covenant-keeping, faithful God. I'm losing it here, Jesus. Take courage in your present. Get a grip on your life. And remember who I've been in your past. And now in your present that you've got a grip, remembering who I am and who I have always been and always will be, number three, don't be afraid. Now, because you've got a grip in your present, remembering who I've been in your past, you can now move forward in your future with a fresh understanding of who I am. Those fresh understandings come in no more powerful way than this. Mark 6 and 53. Let's read that again. When they crossed over, the storm is now calm. Jesus is in the boat. They're no longer straining at the oars. Oh, when they crossed over, where did he send them again? Bethsaida, a little audible here. They landed at Gennesaret and anchored there. Go ahead and bring up that first picture, if you will. So here's where they leave from. Capernaum. And here's where they're going to. Bethsaida. Go ahead and bring up that next picture. A couple miles. The God who can calm storms surely can get them where they need to go. But after they crossed over, where do they land? Next picture. They're now farther away from where they intended to be. So what's the point? The point is this. In the midst of your trials and fresh understandings in a community of people who are driven to always go from point A to point B, it's not always about that. It's about realizing who's on the trip with you in the midst of the journey. You hear me, church? Well, we want to go from here to there. And then we want to go from there to here. And Jesus is saying, when I send you to Bethsaida, it's not always that you get to Bethsaida. In fact, you may be farther away than when you started, but guess who's in the boat with you now that you're there? Church, the thing we need to strive for is having Jesus and a fresh understanding of him in our lives. It's not where you're going, it's who you're with. Let's read for this last point, Mark 6 and verse 51. I'm going to do a little commentary in here on my own, so hang with me. Then Jesus climbed into the boat, climbs into the boat with them. The wind dies down, and they were completely amazed. For they, and let me pause right there as I try to imagine how Scripture is going to go. They were completely amazed because they had never seen the sea act like this. They were completely amazed. Let's be honest. They're completely amazed. Because he who was walking on land like them was now walking on the water. That's the way scripture should go. If, if I go walk across the duck pond at OC in a few moments, you're going to go, 
We're amazed. Why were you amazed? Because you're walking on water. It's a no-duh moment. Notice scripture says the apostles are going, we're not amazed about that. This is why they're amazed. They're amazed for they had not understood about the loaves. Story that happens before this. Why? For their hearts were hardened. Point number three this morning. You can be in the middle of God's miracle and still encounter hard hearts. They had hard hearts. They're in the midst of God's miracle of him being in the midst of their lives. The kingdom is coming and they're missing everything. It's because their hearts are hard. They had witnessed the multiplication of the loaves, but they had missed the manifestation of the Lord. You can witness the movements of God in your life and still not be moved in your heart by God in your life. Mitch, how do we know that's the case? Because that's kind of a scary proposition. That I can be in the midst of God's miracle and due to a hard heart, in the midst of my trials, miss Jesus in the midst of the storm there with me. The Gospel of John chimes in to this story and contributes a verse that gives us a sign of a hard heart. John 6 and 15. When he lands there in Gennesaret and they're all wanting to be healed and they're all wanting to be touched, John throws in one other thing they wanted to do. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him, force him to be king, withdrew again to a mountainside by himself. In essence, what they are saying is, you served us, now serve us again. They are entitled people. The sign of a hard heart is when you have an entitled mindset and an entitled heart. God's kingdom is here to serve me. Let me make this real, church, and let me preach it myself. Moments ago, he multiplied the bread for you. Somebody says, did I miss that? No, the men came by, down the aisles. They passed the trays, and he multiplied the bread of grace, his body, and you partook of it. Let me ask you a question, and I'm, getting, I'm really preaching at me right now, and if you want to come along for the ride, then come on along for the ride. Did you take of that bread, and for a moment, your heart did this? Done this before. I'm really thinking about lunch. I'm thinking about trials. I'm thinking about, oh, Mitch, you know, hey, I've been doing this for decades. Uh, church, that's the beginnings of an entitled heart. That's the beginning of a heart that's operating out of routine. Let us come this morning to his table and let us with bended knee gather round his table again and remember the miracle of grace that he has brought us today. And in the midst of the multiplication of grace and bread and life to us, be done with what can his kingdom do for me and what can the church do for me and instead come carrying that cross and say, Lord, wherever you would have me go, whatever it will cost, whatever, Father, I have to lay down, because of what you have done, I no longer, Father, do this out of rote or routine, but once again with a fresh heart, a new heart, with new wine and new power, I come to your table of grace and because what you have given me and because how you see me again and again, you offer this. I am done with entitlement. I am done with routine. And I am done with lukewarm Christianity. And Father, I give you my all. Today, in the middle of your storm, can you begin to see that you're in the middle of the miracle of Jesus revealing himself in a fresh way to you? And today, as you are straining in anxiety, perhaps even with that old hard heart, can you come today and with a fresh understanding see how God sees you? I guess it was just about a little over 12 hours ago I was standing there with this Bible, and there he was, and there she was, and I said, 
to you and to you, rings, you may kiss your bride. And one of the greatest joys that I get in ministry is standing there with that young man as those doors swing open and in she walks. And everybody, when I say please rise, and everybody looks back at the bride. I, I get a good shot of the bride, but the great view, let me challenge you, don't always look at the bride. Look back at the groom at his face. Here are some of the faces I've seen in the past. This is the one I call just the hand over the mouth, where the guy goes, he's speechless. This next one is when the guy is just knocked to it. I mean, literally, knees, mouth open. This next one, I love this one. The, the guys don't do this one. This is called the ugly cry, all right? <laughs> this is where people in the crowd are going, is he good with this? <laughs> you, know, you can cry, but don't go ugly cry, all right? This next one, another one where the knees are beginning to buckle. I mean, where the guy's just going, are you kidding me? This next one, here's a guy from like SEAL Team 6 Marine. <laughs> Tough guy. He's six years old again going, church, let me say this. If this morning you're going, yeah, I've given way to anxiety. <laughs> My heart's <laughs> Jesus calls you. His bride. And when people come back to me. Uncle Gabriel, do you do you see her? Uncle Gabriel, do you I pray that in the And from that understanding, for you. today, if you midst of trials that are knocking, you that you want him to be Lord of your life through baptism, will you come now as we stand and as we sing?